those of you that are already in know Alan not to chew already. He is just like an incredible sort of media guru. Um, and let me just tell you a little bit about who he is ex exactly. He's a learning experience designer at Madison College. Um, he used to be an artist and used to be an actor too, right? Yep. I remember that. I remember that. Um, he used to work with the likes of ABC, Disney, the Smithsonian, and um, he shifted tra training career um, when he got a job at Apple. And what was that like? Tell, what's like working for Apple? That, that must have been fun. That was pretty intense. Um, I got hired on by the retail division of Apple to be a technology trainer called a creative. And I worked individually with people to learn about or to help them learn about their Apple products. And that's where I really learned how, my patience because <laughs> uh, eight hours a day, you know, five days a week, uh, holiday season, anytime there's a uh, back to school season, there's a lot of people who want to learn more about their devices. So uh, they came to us and I was one that provided that one-on-one -on -one assistance. Wow. So is that really where you kind of learn how to be, you know, where, how you figured out, you know, innovation was something that you wanted to, to, to continue with was working with, uh, with those, that those, uh, with those systems and hardware. A little bit. I think more of my innovation or tinkering came from filmmaking where, you know, no budget had to make something work and tried to find a way to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's great. It's great that you've been able to kind of like cross over from that creative side and use it to help people in education. I love that. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask you, I, first of all, thank you so much for doing this. I love, um, I love this idea of talking about some real world scenarios of implementing <laughs> VR. And um, because I actually, I have an HTC Vive myself and I, you know, probably turn it on like every once in a while, maybe once a month. Um, and it wasn't easy getting it going, right? Mm -hmm. And when I thought, when I think about using VR for education, I'm like, you know, I think it's a great idea, but then all, you know, but then there's that hardware thing to overcome. And I have an, I actually have an IT background. And I know when I got started with just getting my vibe going and just all the pieces that were required and just making sure that I had the correct system for it. I'm like, this, it does become kind of an, an IT thing to start out with. Yeah. And so I can't even imagine implementing multiple devices to, you know, whatever, if, you, if you've got like a courses designed or, or whatever experience you're trying to create. So I'm so glad that you're going to talk about this. I, I wanted to know, like, what was your first virtual reality experience? And, Ooh. you know, when did you see the potential for, for learning? Like when you were working with it, was it, did somebody tell you, Hey, you know, hmm. I think that, uh, it would have to be a couple of years ago. I was at the Learning Solutions Conference and they had VR set up, PlayStation VR. I got to go and play with that. And that, that was yeah. a hell of fun. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. But uh, my second experience is what sold me on it because VR can be entertaining, but there's also that learning aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And they had a demo of um, of an anatomy, anatomy app. So I was in there and I was able mm -hmm. to stretch apart the human body and go really into uh, – different sections of the body and being a colon cancer survivor, I went straight to the colon mm -hmm. and I got to see, okay, this was the disease part yeah. and I get to see the lymph nodes because the doctor wow. says, well, the disease can travel up the lymph nodes. And I'm like, how far is that? And I got to see it travel all the way up to the lungs and wow. like, uh, it's all that connection. So that was really mind blowing. And, oh, I can imagine. Uh, is and that's that, what told me. I'm like, we got to get this. We got to get this started now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so how, did you, how did you get um, buy-in at Madison College? Oh, um, we are a tech school here in Madison, mm -hmm. Wisconsin. We have nine different campuses across South Central Wisconsin. And uh, we're looking to, to this to engage our students. We're also looking to work with other companies around the area who might be interested in VR. Um, we got a class that's attempting to, to do VR as a class, not just, you know, one-on-one -on -one or in, in person class or hybrid class, but strictly VR. Wow. So that's wow. Gonna, that, that's, that's, that's going to be a lot of fun. So you've got it going and what are some of the outcomes that you've seen so far? Any, any results? spend some time everyone loves this once they put it on vr is an experience that you have to experience yourself it's not something that you can talk about and really share it's one of those things where you have to 
put on the headset, grab the controllers, and take it for a spin. Yeah, yeah. No, I um, there was recently. I just, you know, I hadn't I hadn't gotten my vibe going for a while, and then recently I just turned it on and I looked for like what was in the top ten in the Steam store, mm-hmm. and there was this jetpack game that everybody was playing. So I decided to try it, and that thing literally like just took me away, and I, you know, yeah. I actually fell to my knees at one point because I was just flying around too much. And it really is. It's so incredibly immersive. Mm-hmm. All right. Excellent. Well, I am looking forward to hearing your misadventures. I think that we don't hear about misadventures enough because everyone's like, oh, yeah, VR is great. AR is great. And um, I also want to mention next month, everybody, um, I'm, for November, we're going to do uh, VR, AR. I'm just going to call it XR. Um, for our playlist. So we're going to have a series of, of, of speakers talking about that. Alan is going to be in that playlist. And um, I have a few other folks I'm going to bring on. I'm also going to be at Devler next week. So I'm going to um, hit up some folks there to see if they want to be on the playlist. So keep an eye out for that. This month, we're do, we're currently running the data and data measurement and analytics playlist. Um, so jump into that if you can. Next month will be XR. And I think in, um, in December, I'm doing AI. And with that, I am going to disappear and uh, let you take it away. All right. Welcome to my messy cubicle. (laughs) So uh, I got into VR because I wanted to uh, see what I could do with it. My main computer is a Mac computer, and a lot of the VR systems don't run on the Mac. So I was like, okay, how can I make this happen? If you don't know me or learn or know much about me, I am a very big MacGyver type person. I like to tinker, I like to create, I like to uh, make stuff happen. So I was doing some research and I was wondering, okay, how can I get an Oculus to run on my Mac? The Oculus founder has said that an Oculus will never run on a Mac unless they build a better computer. And me being a Mac person, like challenge accepted. So um, what I did, I did some research. I researched, okay, I can boot into my computer as a Windows machine and then install Oculus on there. Easy peasy, it seems like that would work. When I initially tried that, it did not work. It said that my graphics card was not optimized for VR. Um, So I got another idea, okay. What happens if I get an external graphic processing unit, an eGPU? Now, eGPU is something that's pretty cool because it adds power to your computer. Drop that link in there. Um, If your computer has a Thunderbolt 3 connection on it, you would be able to uh, add more capability to it. Um, Think of it as a very awesome... USB hub, you can add memory, uh, not memory, you could add storage, you can add all sorts of different ports, or in this case, I could actually connect a big graphics card to my computer. So I got the biggest graphics card that I could find, um, I'm forgetting the name of it, and that box that I posted in the, in the, uh, the link that I posted in the chat, that box was almost too small for this graphics card. So me being a tinkerer, I had to try to make this graphics card fit. And I don't know if you ever seen a graphics card outside a computer, one of these gaming graphics cards, but they look insane. Um, I'm going like this, because it was literally that big, kind of like a big sandwich, about the same size as one too. And so I'm taking apart this box to try to make this graphic cards fit. And I'm being very careful because I spent a lot of money, a lot of my company's money, trying to convince them, okay, this is something that I need for this project. And I finally got it in. Long story short, everything worked just fine. I loaded up boot camp and tried to do VR on it. I ran the VR test. Each uh, VR system, Vive, Oculus, Steam has a test that you can run to make sure that your computer is up to snuff for VR. Well, my computer finally hit all those check marks. And I was like, all right, yes, 
I'm going to install Oculus. I'm going to put on this Rift, this new Rift that we just got, and I am going to be jabbing by the end of the day. Three weeks later, that has not happened. <laughs> what happened is uh, when I tried to install the Oculus software, onto my Windows side of the Mac, it needed 40 gigabytes of space. Um, I don't know if you, if we have Mac users out there, but Boot Camp is a program that will allow you to install Windows on your Mac. You have to allot some storage space to that. I allotted 40 gigabytes just because I wanted Windows to install. And I was thinking, okay, well, maybe I can install other programs onto an external drive, you know, offset that space. When I tried to install the Oculus program on the Windows side of my Mac, it did ask me to download 40 gigabytes of stuff and that did not happen. When I tried to install the Oculus software onto an external drive, it told me that it can't install on an external drive. It has to install on the main C drive. So I'm like, Ugh. Okay, back to the drawing board. I'm a big hacker, so I managed a way to get Boot Camp to run off of an external drive. I'm going to plug it into my Mac and get it going. And I was able to get Windows going off that external drive. I was able to connect my big graphics card to that external drive. And I was able to install the Oculus software onto that external drive. But the Oculus headset would not run. Now I'm think I know what you're thinking. Why don't you get a PC for this? I ended up doing that. <laughs> uh, the point of the story is I spent a lot of time trying to get uh, my Mac to be my main computer, to be my only computer. I don't want to be lugging around two computers. But in the end of trying to get everything to talk to each other on a Mac, I broke down and I got a decent Alienware computer. Now, um, once I got my Alienware computer, I'm like, okay, uh, I'll be up and running by the end of the day. Plug it in and I don't know if you ever turn one of those on, but the keyboard lights up as a rainbow. That just fills me with so much joy. <laughs> I love turning it on and seeing that rainbow effect on the keyboard and then getting to work on it. <laughs> but as with all computers, <laughs> ah, thanks, thanks, Kim. Uh, as with all computers brand new, you have to update them. So um, with Alienware, they're meant for gaming machines. They're meant to be VR machines. And there's a certain sequence of things that you have to do to get it optimized. First thing is to update the Alienware software. <laughs> uh, there's a built-in program on that particular machine that will update the Alienware specific software uh, to that machine. Then you have to update the graphics card drivers to that machine. Then you have to update Windows 10 onto that machine. Then you have to install Oculus plug in your headset, and then have it update not only the program, but your Oculus headset. There's a lot of updating to this process. That took me maybe four hours in that first uh, time to try to get everything to get going because I was waiting for updates. Brand new machine out of the box, update one, update two, update three, update four. So the next day I was able to um, finally get it started. Um, but one thing about the updates is that you got to be careful to make sure that you're always updated, but at the same time that you're not. Uh, the Oculus software that I downloaded and updated would not allow me to run my Oculus headset. I, it had like a black screen whenever I put it on. And I realized that my connections were wrong. I'm able to connect that big video card that I purchased to this Alienware machine because it has a Thunderbolt 3 adapter or Thunderbolt 3 port. It also has USB-C. Um, I don't have, 
I don't have any USB-C cables right in front of me, but they're the new type of cable. They look kind of round, oblong, uh, but they're meant to connect everything and anything. Thunderbolt is backwards compatible with USB 3C, but Oculus does not like me to connect the headset to that port. It took me three hours to figure that out. So I reconnected my headset and once I pulled the port that required USB 3 connection and put it in its proper port, everything started working again. I don't want to scare anyone off, and I hope that you're learning uh, from what I've gone through to set up a VR headset. Because, yeah, it sounds like there's a lot of things that were happening to me that prevented me from even putting it on and enjoying my first experience. Uh, the big takeaway from this is to when you open the box make sure all your software is updated the oculus software or your uh, vr software should be installed and updated last because you want to make sure your computer and all associated programs are up to date first and read the instructions on how to connect your vr headset to your computer and follow it to a t thunderbolt 3 connections and USB-C connections look and behave the same. On the tech side of things, uh, Thunderbolt is faster than USB-C, but they look the same, they plug the same, the wires look exactly the same. And I thought, okay, if I plug it in here, that's no big deal, but it turned out to be a very big deal. I was finally able to get my Oculus Rift S headset up and going. But oh, the graphics were very choppy. Uh, it broke my heart because I invested so much of the company's money to purchase this PC, to purchase this um, VR headset, and it was running very choppily. I wasn't getting that full experience. So I had to go into the settings and change one of the settings to make sure that it runs great. Inside your VR program, it will ask you if you want to run quality or performance. If you run into the issue where things are not looking great, uh, things are shaking, things are not clear, in that switch, change it from performance to quality. Um, Performance is good, but that's like the high-end graphics quality. Uh, it will just increase the speed of the connection from your headset to your computer. There will be a little dip in the graphics quality, but it's hardly noticeable, especially if you're new to the VR world. That took me three days <laughs> to figure out. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And once I figured that out, once I updated the entire machine from getting the box to actually using it. Um, if we do the math right, that took about a week. Troubleshooting of trying to get everything updated, trying to make sure my connection's right, and trying to make sure that the experience was awesome for whoever puts this headset on. Now I got that workflow. That is great. I got asked to uh, set up some Oculus Quest headsets. Now there's this big thing in VR where um, the traditional VR headset would connect to your head, you'd be able to see it, but you were connected to a cord. Oculus released a new headset called a Go, Oculus Go, and that was the first headset that you could put on and use without um, being connected to a cord. The next model that they released after that is the Oculus Quest. The difference between the two is that uh, Go is very good for entertainment, not so much for games. Uh, you got one controller that you can control everything with. The Oculus Quest behaves much like its bigger sibling, the Oculus Rift S. It has the same controller setup. It has the same design uh, for the headgear. And I was responsible for setting up 25 of these bad boys. That's a lot. And there's no way to speed up the process. It takes me about 15 to 30 minutes to set up each headset individually. 
the quest touts itself as being not tethered to a computer. The Go says that you don't need a, a phone to use it. The Quest says the same thing because uh, entry-level VR, you would take your phone, put it in a box, put it in your face, and then be able to experience VR that way. You do need the app, the Oculus app installed on your mobile device. You need to create, a, uh, in my case, I wanted to make sure that each headset had its own individual login so that if someone wanted to demo that particular headset, we can install apps for them. Uh, we can ha have apps pre-installed on that particular device. And if we need to purchase anything extra, we could tie it to that single device. So I got 25 emails from tech services here at my organization, strictly for VR. And I assigned each VR headset to one of those email addresses. And then once I had that email address, I set up each headset in the Oculus app to work with, um, set up the Oculus account to work with that headset. Things would go better if I wasn't forced to go and watch the safety video every single time. Uh, by the end of the process, I got so good, I was like tap, 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 click, tap, 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 click, and be done with it. That's how I was able to gain speed and complete a setup in 15 minutes. But when I first started, it took me 30 minutes to get from unboxing, charging, setting up an app account, and getting it ready. And that's just to get it up and running so that people can experience it um, as is. That's not any special request. I have I was working with one of our chemistry teachers and she was given an app that can run on the Quest, but it's not available through the Quest App Store. Facebook owns Oculus Quest and they're trying to create this kind of app store garden where you can purchase apps directly from this app store and everything will be okay. However, this app cannot be downloaded from the App Store. It has to be loaded directly onto the headset. It took me a while to figure this out, to get that app onto the headsets, and I had to turn each individual account into a developer account. Now we're getting into some tricky stuff here. If you want to download stuff to your um, Oculus Quest from the App Store, that's great. If you want to add additional apps that are not found in the Oculus Quest, you have to create an organization. <laughs> now, this is going to sound weird, but um, you s do a Google search for Oculus Developer, and that will take you to a place where you could set up your own um, development company. And from there, you can create your own development company and assign people to that company. Now, um, Kim asked the question, third-party apps. Okay, well, um, this app was created, this particular app that I was talking about was created by another chemistry teacher. And they didn't submit it to the Oculus Store to get approval so it could be hosted at. Um, so I had to take this app and then put it on the headset through a process called sideloading. If you Google, Oculus Quest side loading, there's a two recommendations that pop up that make it a lot easier. But the first step is to make each account a developer account. And then once you made each account a developer account, you have to go into the headset. You have to go through the app and turn on developer mode. And then you're able to sync that third party app to the Quest. Since doing this, I've been bombarded by Facebook ads for uh, Viveport, Viveport. Uh, HTC Vive has their own app store as well, but they're allowing Rift users access to that store. And the side loading process is the same for an Oculus Rift, an Oculus Quest, or an Oculus Go. So it took me about three days to get all these VR headsets up and running. I got a batch of them out 
in students' hands and they're playing around with them for the next three weeks. And in um, the third week, they're gonna attend that class strictly in VR. And I put in a lot of time to try to make things as simple as possible because I am managing so many devices. Um, I got to think about other things like cleaning wipes, uh, make sure all the plugs and all the cables are, can, are with the devices that I check out, the cases for those devices. Uh, what happens if a device doesn't work? Who gets the call to help them out? And I was, um, so I was providing um, not only technical support, setup support, but also on-call support for this particular product, for this particular project. And VR is hard. I'm not going to lie to you to go from managing one headset like an Oculus Rift, getting it all set up and getting it ready for uh, VR demos and for VR experiences to managing a classroom set. That is very hard and it's very time consuming. It's operating much like how the iPad first came out. I don't know if anyone out there has ever managed a large set of iPads at the very beginning, but you did have to create individual accounts for those iPads. You did have to buy stuff from the in, uh, individual app stores. Apple got smart and they started providing bulk purchase of apps, providing a way to manage and update those iPads all in one shot. So you're not there updating a single iPad, um, one iPad for every 10 minutes. You could do 20 iPads in one shot in 15. And you could download apps to those iPads in an additional 15 minutes and be done with those 20 iPads in less than an hour. Oculus does not have that feature. It's behaving much like a single um, user device. However, Oculus is coming out with a business edition of the Quest. The Quest headsets, $400, I believe. The business edition is $1,000. And supposedly that has features where you can do more of those uh, remote, uh, what do you call it? Uh, remote updates to so manage them so you don't have to touch them to set them up. Uh, just uh, do the installs uh, quickly without having to watch the safety video. <laughs> I don't know about HTC, uh, HTC Vive and what they do, but when I was researching that platform, they do have an um, enterprise VR headset that can be managed through Active Directory. And that piqued my interest and I am purchasing one of those to see how that would behave in our organization because we are, use Active Directory for our logins. And that's my uh, misadventure in VR. It took a lot of time to uh, get things up and running. And when you do go in to the path of VR, you are gonna spend a lot of time setting up and a lot of troubleshooting. But if you have any questions, you could always get in contact with me. I'm on Twitter at Notachu. Um, I'm on Instagram and I'm also on LinkedIn. And I have a question. Oh, oh no, I was going to jump in. Yeah, there is there is one question. Let me go ahead and read this off to you mm -hmm. so that for like our, our podcast folks, they can hear this one. What right. industries seem primed to use the latest version of VR tech outside of um, medical and military? Ooh. Stuff where we can put people in harm's way without actually put them in harm's way. Um, Designing Digitally did a VR experience where it's chopping down trees. Madison College has an urban forestry program and I want to introduce that, pro that VR experience to them. And um, if uh, things like active shooter scenarios or um, empathy training where you could be on the other side of uh, the topic. Mm -hmm. um, let's say, and this is going to go into um, 
uh, political territory, so I'm not for or against this. I'm just bringing up this scenario. But uh, you could create a scenario in VR where you can be a person going to an abortion clinic. You could be the person who's protesting it and switch those viewpoints so that you can see the experience from the protester and the experience for the person going in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think early on, one of the more popular applications for VR and media was kind of that empathy thing. I know that um, there was a short film that was made that was um, that it was a VR experience right after a bombing. And mm -hmm. you could just kind of walk around this area and sort of see what, you know, the uh, the result of that bombing was. It was really intense. I actually couldn't do it for a very long. I had to exit out. <laughs> but the thing that I've seen, like myself, I you know, there was a period of time where I was going to some, v, you know, VR expos and just checking things out. What I thought was really interesting was um, the applications for industry. Like, mm -hmm. um, like for instance, I used to work on, a, um, on an assembly line for a glass manufacturing company. And there were times that we would have to load sheets of glass that were like, you know, you know, 96 by 144 inches, so eight by 12, just these big sheets of glass. And it'd take two guys to kind of with gloves on and you'd have to slowly put it up against the table and just rock it down. Otherwise the thing would just shatter, you know, you had to be really, really careful. Um, and then we would cut pieces and then we would take that glass and load them into these machines to insulate the glass, to make windows. Anyway, that, job was actually pretty dangerous and um if you were training for that like th that was the one thing is you needed like two weeks of just standing there and watching everybody else before they even let you touch a piece of glass but with vr i think that would actually help you like get next to a machine and and understand like okay this is how you you know, move your hands this way and you load it you rest it on these wheels this way i think it'd be um absolutely absolutely fantastic for that and also AR in industry, I, I saw like people putting together engines where you could put on goggles mm -hmm. and it would show you like, okay, so there's a missing piece right here that this is, here's the piece like in sort of a, uh, you know, like a, like a hologram type of effect. And you just take that piece and it drops down here next to whatever the carburetor or something. And, I, and, and I thought that was actually a really fantastic application. Yeah, Google Glass died in the consumer market, but it's taken off in industry just for that reason. Oh, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Now, so can you tell us how you guys are using, um, you know, VR to train or what what kind of subject matter you guys like, you know, aside from you said chemistry, but um, what else are you using it for? Marketing, science, um, EMS training. Uh, I do want to do more empathy training here. Uh, but yeah, it runs wide spectrum and we hope to keep innovating and helping our students with different topics that a faculty might want to research and that's where I step in yeah and the faculty comes into me and says hey I want to do this in VR I'm like okay let's sit down let's have a talk and I'll do some research for you and let's see what we can do yeah now so here's the, the compelling thing for me because I think that I mean there is an entire conference that the e-learning guild does it's dedicated to VR but really what you're talking about, what you just had to go through was like definitely uh, an IT type of um, mm -hmm. challenge, right? But yeah. you're a learning experience designer. You're not supposed to be doing this IT stuff. And I think that there are a lot of folks that are like that. Now, if you didn't have the background that you did, you would. this would have just been, you know, a huge sort of mountain to overcome. Yep, I would have um, just said nope and walk away. Right, right. But you, you know, I think you're uniquely sort of qualified to be able to do this. What do you think? I mean, for other folks that are like wanting to get into this, the reality, like I kept on thinking about that when I was like promoing this thing, but the reality of virtual reality is it's like, it's not that easy. I know I have, I have an HTC Vive, you know, there are like what, four or five connections that have to go in. And mm -hmm. I know when I first did it, it's like, oops, I didn't completely connect that one in. You have to troubleshoot. And, you know, even the graphics card, I bought a $400 graphics card that I'd ins yeah. insert into like my my uh, desktop machine, just go through that process. I, I know what you're saying. There is a lot of pain that happens there. And your typical, you know, instructional designer, learning experience designer is not really going to have this kind of background. Yeah. I mean, what have you seen? I mean, it, do, are, do you think, it, I mean, basically, are people just sort of like selling this stuff without actually telling people the reality of like implementing VR isn't just all, I think, who was it, Kim said, like a better roses? Some people um, 
are selling VR, but they're also selling packages to help manage that. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, those companies are great to be working with because not only can you purchase that product VR experience from them, but they would also offer a VR box and they would offer, um, yeah, anything happens to that headset, anything happens to the computer, just send it back and you'll get a new one and they'll help you troubleshoot it. That's great. Um, but again, there are a lot of other companies um, that just sell the experiences and then walk away and it's up to you to figure out how to make it work. Right. Yeah. And that's a challenge into itself. So in some of your misadventures, just being able to, I mean, have you seen anything as far as the students taking the devices and maybe not using them correctly? Or, you know, like, do you have any, any feedback on that? Not yet, but because they're students, I bet they're going to be breaking the headsets in ways that we can't imagine. <laughs> Yeah, and and yeah, because I, I I think that like once you get in there, it is it's almost like you in, are immediately taken to a completely different place. Mm -hmm. And um and and there's like for instance, there's this place. Sorry, I'm gonna I'm sort of like digressing a little bit, but the way there's a place called the Wave VR that I occasionally go to, and it's kind of like a rave sort of dance party that happens. Like they they have shows like weekly and mm -hmm. it is absolutely an insane experience it is so super fun it's like going to a concert in your headset and you know and it happens globally so um i can imagine just sort of like checking out of your course and going and attending a rave instead you yeah know, like if if <laughs> if if because the amount of distraction um so let's see oh, john just i'm going to read john's comment out here maybe the advice could also be for schools and companies to start smaller Crawl before they walk, walk before they run. Instead of attempting all in large scale deployment with 25 quests, start with two or three and pilot test with a subset of interested users to test the waters and gather data. See how it's received, what works, what doesn't work, then scale with this knowledge in mind. Yeah, I think that's uh that's that's a great, great, great comment, John. Mm -hmm. Have you so I mean, did you so you got you had the one Oculus device that you started out with? And then you just got the 25, right? Yep, because so. we needed a classroom set. We didn't know how many students in the class there were going to be. So. And we also have faculty coming in that want to check them out to see, OK, what's the hype about? And then we have faculty say, I have this app. I want to install it. Can you help me? So it's That's been a, wild. Around well, here. you know, the other thing is it what amazes me is that you guys are even doing that, that you guys that for like a higher ed. Um, you know, uh, organization to just like, yeah, let's buy 25 quests. That's mm -hmm. yeah. Done. A lot of, a lot of grants, <laughs> a lot of grant funding. I yes. guess so. That's cool. So what, so next steps, what do you guys, what's, what's happening next with this whole curriculum of yours? You guys are, you know, you're building courses or um, what else is happening right now? The sky's the limit. This is a test pilot that we're doing and we're going to evaluate in six and 12 months to see where, where we need to take it further. Excellent. But, yeah, I would like to see more of this done in a classroom, and I'd like to see a better management workflow for our VR headsets. I'm going to – so I, I do have one more question from, um, from Mark here. If our firm wanted to pitch developing VR-related content to clients, new or existing based on need, and we primarily use Captivate to develop e-learning, et cetera, what's the bare minimum in equipment software we need to get started to – to start developing this as a product. Okay, so Mark, I would update to the latest version of Adobe Captivate because that does offer VR authoring uh, 360 experiences um, that could get you started. Um, I would also recommend getting a 360 camera and a tripod that would fit it. Um, I do like the one series, the Insta one series uh, for 360 cameras. Some people are really into the Theta series, um, but update Captivate, get a 360 camera. And then from there, start building out this a small project. It could be something as simple as a room tour or something as um, something like lockout training or how to climb a ladder, uh, OSHA requirement stuff. Um, and so that would be primarily um, so, so 360 video, not like any kind of simulations or anything you build out of Unity or something? Nope. Just 
just like setting up a traditional e-learning to take the picture and mark the points and then uh, set it up that way. But uh, Adobe Captivate does allow you to do the VR. So you're already halfway there. And with Adobe Captivate, you could export to desktop VR where you could go around, mouse around and see that, make it compatible with tablets and mobile devices or make it uh, a headset experience. Wow. Is that something that you've already worked on or with? I've done some, yes. Uh, but my trial has ended. <laughs> <laughs> we better talk to Adobe about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. It, it is a great tool. And another tool that I would recommend if you are interested in working with that is Wanda VR. I'm going to put the thing in the, the URL in the chat. This is one that I'm really interested in because it seems so simple. I have yet to pull the trigger on this, but um, out of all the uh, VR companies, this one's a good one. And if you're doing medical stuff or if you're doing um, uh, that kind of training, uh, there is, hey, John, a catechist. Drop that link in there, John. Uh, Oh, that's John. Right, John. That's yep. right. John was a guest. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> yep. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's another great platform. I've been able to demo it. I've seen it in action, and it is phenomenal to create the 360 experience, um, the virtual reality experience, not just a 360 camera experience, but actually putting things, setting things up, and controlling your environment. It is very cool. You know, and I actually wanted to ask about that. Could a catechist, could we record a conversation in a catechist? Yep. So if I, if I wanted to interview you about, you know, VR or anything, and then be able to actually output a recording that people could check out in virtual reality or even in just on a desktop, is that possible? Yeah? <laughs> okay. So we'll talk offline about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So... Any other questions out there? I'd love to hear them. We're um, we're trying to keep these TLD casts a little closer to like you know 40, 45 minutes. Um, and let's see. I think that uh, if you don't have anything else to add, Alan, or you do you have anything? I'm gonna drop my info into the chat for Instagram, for Twitter, for LinkedIn. So if we're not connected, we can connect. Excellent. And Alan's a regular doing TLD casts. Um, and thank you so much for that, Alan, always coming in monthly. And everybody, just so you know, um, I mentioned it earlier in the show, but um, so this month we're running the uh, the data um, measurement and analytics playlist, which is, I mean, if you're doing anything in LND, you should probably check out that playlist because data is just where everything is going. And, and but next month we're going to do AR, VR, XR. Um, I'm going to, you know, build the program out. Alan is going to be one of the speakers next month, um, but I'm going to be grabbing a bunch more probably next week when I'm at DevLearn. And so look forward to that. December, I'm probably, looks like I'm going to be doing something on AI and learning. Um, and so we have an exciting end um, to 2019. And with that, um, thank you, everybody. Uh, looking forward to seeing you at the next one. We, the next playlist is going to be, the next episode is going to be A.D. Dietrich on Tuesday. And um, otherwise, if you're going to be Devil Learn, please say hi. I would love to um, talk to you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye. Bye.